Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Our next presentation will be sheltering and evacuation of people and animals with James Sawyer. It's a privilege to have James present today. All bios and abstracts are available to read from our website under speakers. Before we get started, a little basic housekeeping. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we will endeavor to answer those at the end. This year we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use hashtag G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F for Twitter and other social media. A short evaluation will be made available when you exit the session. That's really important. And just a reminder, the video recording will not be available until it's been edited and it will be released later on this year. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to welcome James to GADMC. Thanks very much, Rebecca. And um, thanks to uh, everybody who's attending out there. Um, I'm, as, as mentioned, I'm running uh, a session on sheltering evacuation of people and animals. I'm gonna race through the slides, I guess, try and give us some time for discussion and questions. Uh, if I can advance the slides. There you go. So um, I think probably I wanna leave you with a, a couple of thoughts at the end of this. The first is that this remains a significant planning gap. Um, especially when we consider the scale of this. And we'll touch upon this on the scale of that a little bit in, in, in the scope of the presentation. It has broad scope. It this, this topic touches everything from refugee internally displaced people's camps through to companion animals um, in earthquake zones. Um, for the purpose of keeping things tight in terms of scope for this presentation, I'm largely going to focus on uh, urban uh, scenarios and companion animals. So what do we know? Well, most of what we know is born from responder experience rather than planning experience, I would argue. The larger urban disasters, Katrina, Haiti earthquake, Japanese earthquake, Fukushima, as many know it, um, and to some extent, emerging work coming out of the Ukraine crisis. Um, early stage studies uh, across the board on this over the last 20 years have shown that there are lots of factors around evacuation with, uh, with animals that, um, that, that, that kind of impact, whether that's socioeconomic standing, number of children in the family, whether individuals have multiple pets or single pets, their education level and their support networks. And I think whilst a lot of the initial research that's been done in this area is really, really good, it only scratches the surface. And I think we really do need more research to understand people's behavior with animals in evacuation. So just looking at scale and species, um, we're probably thinking in our minds, dogs, cats, livestock, but of course in urban areas, we're also thinking about other animals with complex needs. Anybody who's been in an urban city uh, will tell you all sorts of animals come out of people's front doors and windows, birds, reptiles, arachnids, you name it. Um, and of course we need to consider in certainly uh, Europe, US, Australasia, um, that we have this concept of hobby farmers as well, which blurs the lines again between kind of livestock and companion animals. Um, often, uh, you know, certainly in my discussions with emergency planners, they can be some of the trickiest characters to actually kind of pull into the coordination system. And then when we think about this further in certain parts of the world, certainly Southeast Asia and Latin America are a good example, we see this con concept of peri-urban livestock as well. In 2010, in the Haiti earthquake, we saw lots of this 2013 in the Philippine cyclone, uh, Typhoon Yolanda. Um, lots of people keeping small numbers of animals in their backyard, almost as a kind of an economic insurance policy, if you like. What do the figures show us? Well, just to, just to use two, the UK, the US, broadly somewhere around about 60% of the population own pets, um, and over 70% of those owners consider pets as a family. And that's that's significant because it drives people's behavior. Hesterberg 2012 estimated that the sheltering needs for uh, animals in in these kind of areas is 20 percent of the human population. However, the numbers really are not that clear. 
Um, if we were to take Hesterberg's figures, that would say an urban movement of 50,000 people would re require a sheltering need of 10,000 pets uh, or companion animals. Uh, yet in Ukraine, we saw two and a half million people move out of Ukraine um, and still not confirm numbers about the numbers of pets. But if we're using that extrapolation, that's half a million pets. Um, from Hurricane Katrina, Rizzuto and Maloney, uh, estimated 2,000 animals a day needing shelter in Katrina. But then again, if we come back to some of Hesterberg's studies, it shows 70% of animal owners would attempt to take their animals with them when they evacuate. There are so many factors involved with this and so little research that we do need to do more and understand more. But what we do know from these figures, doesn't matter what percentage we pick, is that the potential management and planning implications are large for this. When we think about human behavior that impacts upon this, what we already know is that people can and do refuse to evacuate without their animals. People do return to danger zones to care for animals that they've had to leave behind. Animals can impede and hinder the rescue and recovery process. People demonstrate unexpected extreme and irrational behavior for their animals. And with no prov provision for animals, people can walk back into harm's way. Um, because it's a choice that, uh, that they would choose to make in that circumstance. So when we think about the impact of that, then there's an impact on the psychological bond people have with animals, which is very important during the recovery phase. It's an impact on human safety, both for people evacuating and for responders. There's a hidden cost, because I would always argue anything that is unplanned is an increased cost when uh, when it when it turns up on your doorstep, but also you know an economic cost as well, a pure economic cost if we're talking about livestock. Um, and the lines are blurred. If we look at this picture on the right, it's a photo I took in Mongolia. It's very difficult for us to really nail down: is this a companion animal or is it livestock? In one sense, we would categorise it as livestock, but you know if you talk to this little boy, he might have a different different view of that. Um, and just a small note at the bottom, there are specific considerations on this topic around livestock and displacement camps, which are whole other topics really probably for future conferences. So if we were to think about a model for resolution, I think it splits into three areas, motivating and informing people, laying the right foundations, and then developing capacity. Motivation and informing people, we know that risk information helps, that people make better decisions when they have better risk information. We know that people trust the information better if that information that's coming from multiple sources is more uniform. And we know that people are less likely to make bad decisions if they have visibility of what capacity, facilities, plans and resources are available for them. And so if we think about how we work with the individual animal owners, groups and organizations to develop family plans and make sure that preparedness happens at the absolute micro scale, then we're more likely to succeed. We think about the foundations, there's obviously a very important one here, which is about policy and legislation. It creates the mandate and framework for all of the resourcing coordination, the planning, and also if we think about Ukraine cross-border, uh, movement of people as well, like the EU changing um, some of it or, or temporary freezing some of its legislation to allow the movement of animals across borders was very critical. Um, obviously, the provision of planning that comes from that policy and legislation in turn answers the who, when, where and how. Um, resourcing creates the tools for the job. And of course, it's really important to remember that's not just money and equipment, that's also human resourcing and how how that uh, the capability of that human resource is developed, uh, making sure that coordination occurs. And by that, I don't mean that animal issues are just bolted on the side of the human issue. They have to be integrated, embedded, aligned, and efficiently uh, part of that. And then of course, practice makes perfect. That old adage, train hard, fight easy, drilling, practicing, ensures that readiness is required so things don't get stale. And then when we think about some ideas around capacity, uh, transport, loading and movement, specialist equipment, if it's required, um, you can see from the photo, a specialist uh, a livestock transport unit, which is to be used where hard standing livestock uh, loading platforms aren't available, but also agreements if you have to move animals across private or public land is quite important to consider.
we think about the basic care needs, but I also highlight within that uh, the ability for normal behaviour. If you start to shelter large numbers of companion animals, do people have the capacity and the ability to go and walk their own dogs so that those dogs can can have a, a kind of a, a normal experience within an abnormal situation. Um, then a huge topic, permanent and temporary sheltering capacity. Um, you know, is that contracted? Is there enough surge capacity? Are the right models for putting up and taking down temporary animal shelters quickly there? Um, there is an assumption that is very commonly voiced by planners that shelters will just pick up the extra capacity of this particular situation despite them not having the capacity or contracts or the resources to do so um, it's a significant issue and then we think about disease how uh, do we manage uh, scares around zoonosis to prevent inhumane culling in the aftermath of disasters as we as we uh, we saw the risk of during the 2010 uh, Haiti earthquake and also control of zoonosis if we're moving animals as around as well and then on from there, identification, rehoming, abandonment, reuniting. I think there's a, there is still remains an issue um, around organisations that want to come in and adopt animals very quickly, especially moving them over international borders, um, assuming those animals are abandoned when in fact they may not be abandoned. Um, and uh, the significant issues that I've, I've seen with that. Security. Animals are, are a financial asset. We saw in Katrina, people attempting to steal dogs for dog fighting gangs, but also livestock rustling could potentially be an issue. Anytime you aggregate uh, anything of any units of high value together, there's, a, there's potential criminality. Um, training of emergency services owners and also those coordinating with the human effort. Equipment owners, responders, receivers, and also planning, as I said, those assumptions around sheltering and who's going to pick up the tab are very, very important. And so then finally, just to move on to, I guess, what I would uh, express as the key actions and principles in terms of actions, adequate policy and legislation, both the rescue cross-border movement uh, for preparedness and also for coordination, equipping, training and enabling responders effectively to handle this issue the right type of preparation, ide identifying facilities, developing contracts, stockpiling, drilling, peacetime coordination practice, informing, educating owners, PSAs, vet clinics, schools, and then allowing coordination and fostering the organization around that. So ensuring that animals are properly embedded. And then if we focus on principles, which I guess we probably could have started with as well, is really, you know, I believe animals owners have a right to ensure their pets are safe and secure. The owners where possible should be able to evacuate with their animals. Um, owners where possible should be sheltered alongside their animals, whether that's within the same shelter or in a shelter that is built uh, alongside the human shelter. And the rigor and discipline around the rehoming and adoption uh, issue uh, comes into play in disasters, whether that is, as I suggest, a kind of cooling off period where NGOs and other organisations that undertake uh, these kind of practices agree for a period of uh, other NGOs attempting to reunite owners first before they start to assume that animals are stray or abandoned. Um, I will end the presentation there um, and hopefully it provides a bit of space for people to ask questions or some discussion. Thank you. That's fantastic, James. I think we do have some questions. Gerardo, did you want to come on and ask your question? Sure. <clears throat> Sorry, I cannot type it. Um, could you describe some of the uh, um, equipment that you showed in your presentation? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I highlighted the uh, the loading ramp for livestock is a good example. Um, certainly larger livestock farms have specific hard standing loading areas for livestock, which are at the same height as trucks. But if you're using different trucks in an emergency, um, all those livestock are in a different space, then you need something that's more adaptable. Um, you also saw blueprints for temporary animal shelters, which are very simple kind of tented structures where the actual walls of the shelters are the tra animal transport cages that we all know and use in our in our day-to-day -day lives. 
Um, and so, you know, there, there are lots of examples of uh, kind of creativity, simple, simple methods of creating stuff. Of course, if we think about the equipment, though, it's kind of pointless without training and without protocols. And a good example would be temporary animal shelters, unless you've got staff who are trained to uh, receive and manage those animals, um, log the details, identification, and then returning animals to the right owners is a huge issue. And again, touches upon that financial risk and also the kind of the identification reuniting risk. Arada, did you have another question? Yeah, uh, there is, there was, there is a few uh, questions typed already. But my last question is, how can you um, identify or help identify and reunite uh, pets uh, through social media when once you put them in in shelters. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, mean, I think there's a there's a challenge. Uh, you know, if if Bob turns up and at a shelter and says, "Hey, that's my dog. How do you prove it's your dog?" I think you know the the I, I certainly believe that the underlying vulnerabilities for disasters come from day to day vulnerabilities. So you know, day-to-day uh, -day microchipping, ID tags, those kind of things are very, very important. Um, but uh, I think, you know, there, there are lots of mechanisms that, that can be used and social media has, a, you know, has a real power when it's used effectively. Um, but of course, we have to be really careful as well because there are risks around that. Um, uh what i've got a question here from steve it says one repeating lesson has been around information management such as centralized database for displaced animals any thoughts of examples of success i mean the short answer would be no even though i think it's a it's a good idea um i'm you know uh, just i uh, not quite sure <laughs> not quite sure how to achieve that steve you may be you may be better uh uh, a t place to answer that. You've also mentioned their advantages, disadvantages for disaster, doggy daycare, or owners drop off their animals so they can tend to other matters. I think, yes, absolutely. I mean, this is kind of what I was touching upon where I was saying animals being sheltered alongside people. I think if you think about the psychological element of owners still being able to access their animals, take them for a walk, um, but be able to hand them back to an NGO or a municipality who can take care of their needs whilst they're dealing with the human needs day to day, I think absolutely critical. And I think that there are, there are lots of opportunities indeed, uh, you know, teams uh, that, that worked with me during the uh, Japan earthquake, that's exactly what we did. Um, you know, we were running sheltering for animals right next door to the people shelters and people did come and go pick up their animals um, take them for walks and it was phenomenally successful and uh, not seen many models like that but I'd like to see more of them. Um, should there be a standard for emergency temporary animal capable shelters? Yeah probably I would say I mean it, it, it probably ought to be a slightly adapted version of uh, you know animal animal shelter protocols you know during peacetime if you like uh, maybe streamlined uh, to be more pragmatic, I guess. Um, I can't see any other. We also have a question. We have a question. Um, are there any special considerations you'd like to share for animal shelters, for example, dogs existing already, already prior to the disaster or emergency? So feral dogs or um, those that are already out there. Yeah, I mean, I I think this is this is the thing again. If we come back to you know what what we can do before a disaster hits, especially in disaster prone areas, I think that's critical. There's a there's a lot of latent experience, knowledge, equipment that that exists in the system day to day. Accessing that is is uh, is tricky unless those individuals have coordinated beforehand. They've worked together beforehand. They've shared those ideas. The only thing that I would offer as a thought, and you know, certainly we saw this in the Philippine cyclone, but many times over, is that we cannot assume that the local capacity is a capacity in the aftermath of a disaster. Uh, I've often seen plans been drawn up where it says, okay, well, this vet clinic will help, and these uh, government veterinary advisors will be able to dive in and do field work. And when you actually look at it, you turn up in the disaster zone, they've lost their houses. Uh, they may have lost their own loved ones. They may not have the mental capacity to respond. They certainly may not even have 
the ability to house themselves, they could quite easily become the displaced people. In fact, we saw this in Ukraine. Large numbers of the veterinary infrastructure became refugees and were crossing borders. Many NGOs actually employed those uh, vets in, in, in that kind of cross-border operation, which I thought was, was laudable. But uh, I think there's a huge element of this, which is around planning and coordination before disasters. It, it, it really is. And Whenever I and, and and perhaps the realistic planning, not just planning. Yes, and when I've lectured on this to town planners, and you expose this issue and the numbers, they just start to go pale because it's just a topic they've never thought of before. And I think it's something that we must continue to press upon so that we don't end up in situations where we're backward engineering things as we have done in in previous disasters. There was one last question. Um, uh, is there any suggestion about wildlife shelters? Um, yeah, tricky one. I mean, I think uh, it depends on the epidemiology of the disaster as to what the wildlife do um, and, and where they go. Um, I think, you know, if we look at something like the Australian bushfires, there certainly was a need to deal with animals that had suffered from burns and smoke inhalation, et cetera. Um, and quite often those organizations in peacetime are pretty poorly funded. I know they are in the UK, they're desperately badly funded. Um, and we might want to ask questions of how we build their capacity in peacetime so that they're ready as well. Um, but, you know, Ukraine disaster was a really good example of how animal shelters, wildlife shelters uh, were all hit sometimes on the front line um, and so their capacity was degraded, but many of these people were very bravely soldiering on. I, you know, I recall 2011 when I was in Sierra Leone talking to the owner of Takagama Chimp Sanctuary who told me how they ran the sanctuary all the way through the war, despite rebels raiding the camp for medical supplies, the camp being shelled, etc. The Some of the conditions that people operate in, in these circumstances are, are pretty unbelievable, but I think there's a real element of this that comes down to building capacity before the disaster that is really critical. Um, two last questions. Uh, we've got the time. So first of all, somebody asked for your email for follow-up. They want to follow up with you. Can Do you have a slide with your email on it? Uh, I don't, but I will type it in the chat for people if that works. Perfect. That and then the last question, we have a good question. Do you know of any European country that serves as a model for having good planning for both evac of animals and housing? Um, well, my experience is probably not that in-depth in Europe, to be honest. Actually, mine has been more outside of Europe. Um, I do think that there's been some really good stuff done in the Netherlands around housing refugees and animals, um, definitely. And a lot of the European countries, I would say in, in, in this current Ukraine situation have kind of stepped up. Um, so I think there, there is latent knowledge there, definitely. I don't think a lot of it's been formalized at this point, um, but I could be I'm not I'm not an in-depth expert on the EU, unfortunately. That's fine. Dr. Sawyer, we really appreciate it. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. It brings together a lot of, of uh, ideas and thoughts, uh, things to think about, and uh, research for all of us. Uh, if there's any um, other follow-up, uh, you can get a hold of Dr. Sawyer at james.sawyer.r. Five at gmail.com.